I want to take things back right now, sort of to, and it was, I think it was Don Bluth's birthday yesterday. Yeah, it was the um, so, yesterday. Yeah, so I wanted to know how that experience of him kind of bringing a big animation studio to Ireland has still kind of impacted the industry out there. I think I was listening to a podcast where people were talking about, you know, just how much of a kind of shot in the arm that whole thing was, but I would love to hear it from, from you guys. We're actually kind of the, the next generation. Like we didn't work with Don Bluth, but because he had set up the studio when we were kids and had set up the college that we went to study in, in Valley Furman, we sort of, he was gone back to Phoenix in Arizona by the time we graduated. But we were, we were taught all our teachers in college had been animators and... Yeah, we even worked on, on uh, light tables that came from the Don Bluth studio just up the road. Really? But we, remember, we went, we went to Don Bluth studios yeah. as teenagers and yeah. we were given a tour in the studios and it was really like going into like, you know, the, the fun factory. There were people <laughs> recording sound effects in one room and people painting cells in another and we were just, oh, wow, this is amazing. So I think if maybe if we hadn't gone there, we might have gone off in a different path. It's hard I, to I know. wonder, and I also, it's funny to think if he hadn't moved back to the States then and we had gone and worked in that studio, would we ever have made our own studio? It's hard to say. Mm. But it's pretty exciting to hear that he's setting up again. I, I saw on Facebook or something that he's got a, a new studio and he's yeah. doing something with Netflix for, it's amazing. Yeah, 82 and still, still going yeah. strong. I know, it reminds me of Dick Williams. Richard Williams, another one of my animation heroes, was still animating well into his 80s. So, yes, you know. yes. Um, well, you know, you've described this movie as sort of the third part of a trilogy that started with Book of Kells. So I was wondering, yeah. was that always the plan? And also, have you run out of Irish mythology to, <laughs> to make movies about? Definitely haven't uh, run. We haven't no. run out. Maybe we've run out of energy. Maybe we've run yeah, out of stamina. But. I don't think you could run out of Irish mythology. Like, there's so many books and so many great stories. Um, you could keep mining it for the rest of your life. But I think... For Tom himself, um, I think like it's good to close off those three films as being so alike. And maybe if there is another one, it'll be different. It might be for a different demographic. It might be, you know, a different tone. It would be a different style. director, a different yeah. style. So it's just good to close off like those three as being very similar. And that, that's, that chapter kind of like finished, you know. I feel like animation takes a long time to get made, but I feel like they're all of a piece. They all speak to a certain transition period in childhood and they speak to themes about nature and they speak to certain themes about parenthood and stuff. So I kind of feel like they fit together, but uh, who knows what direction we'll go in, in next. But yeah, they're definitely of a piece. And back in the day when we started, I imagined a, a box set of DVDs or something, but it took too long. <laughs> Technology's moved on. <laughs> Apple has to make a DVD. They have to get into the DVD business just to put yeah. out a Wolf Walker. <laughs> well, I read today that vinyls are selling more than CDs now, so who knows? Maybe yeah. DVDs will come back. Or maybe VHS, yeah, VHS or VHS. 8mm reels. <laughs> well, I wanted to, to talk about the, the sort of visual language of the movie because it is very striking. And I was wondering how you guys kind of landed on that and how long it took to develop this the look of this movie. And and even explaining sort of what it is that people are looking at, a mixture of 2D and computer and, and what that, that all was. Tom and myself have been friends since we were 11, right? So we kind of <laughs> grew up with the same inspirations. Like we both kind of like the same type of visual art. We like, and, and also from working on Secret of Kells and Song of the Sea together, I think there wasn't any surprises really with the yeah. visuals. Like when we knew, when we developed the story together, we were kind of going, oh yeah, the forest would look like that, the ten would look like that. And so we weren't ever having arguments about the visuals. Um, and I think when we had created two different worlds, the town and the forest, and they had to be in contrast, they had to be conflicting. Um, it was, it kind of like, it kind of tied together uh, that if the town would look like this, then the forest would look the opposite, you know? Um, so the town is like a cage. It's very kind of monochromatic. It's quite dull. It's quite has to be oppressive for Robin. She's trapped in there. And then so the by prince, it looks like yeah, like prince. like wood block prints from the 1600s. And so in contrast to that, then the forest would have to be wild and free and energetic and colorful and a place that she loves. You know, as soon as she would set foot uh, foot in there, it would be like oh wow, this is amazing. So you know, the the visuals have to contrast and and amplify that. Maybe the hardest part and the newest thing for us was the wolf vision when we saw the world through the point of view of the wolves. And that was, as you say, um, 
We brought in Evan McNamara, who is a, a director and animator that we know for a long time here, and he kind of developed that look with us, which was great. And we that was the one that was most open. That wasn't a continuation of stuff we developed in the previous movies. And it was crazy because we really wanted it to be hand-drawn. And the first tests we did was completely hand-drawn without computers and an uh, amazing animator, uh, Emmanuel, uh, um, I, I won't pronounce his surname correctly. Emmanuel did a hand-drawn first, but then what Evan moved to was building the environment in CG in, in virtual reality. And he would make it with VR goggles on, which was kind of amazing. And then he would print out every frame of that fly through the forest or that run through the forest and render it with charcoal and pencil on paper. So we ended up with a real mesh of like super modern computer animation, VR stuff with really old school uh, pencil and paper animation. So it was a lovely combo of both, you know. Wow. And how long did it take to kind of refine that Wolf vision? Because I remember it being in the like, what was it, 2017? The kind of like pre original trailer. That yeah. was the one unassisted by computers by amazing amount of us. Yeah. <laughs> It took but, um, a long time. It took it's a long time to face how much work it was too. It took yeah, like um, like Evan developed a, you know a, a, a kind of an assembly line type approach, um, but the, the 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 people that would render it in the end then suddenly were were faced with like a big stack of paper to get through, and that that took a long time. All right, and animators don't usually animate everything you see on screen. Usually the background is painted on one level, the characters are animated, maybe some magic or water is animated on another level. But to animate the entire frame, frame by frame by hand is quite the undertaking. So that it took a long time to put, once Evan had figured out how we were gonna do it, it still took a long time to pull it off, so. Yeah, but with regards to the visuals, I think it's worth mentioning too, like what a collaborative process it is. Like uh, Wolfwalkers wouldn't look the way it is without a huge team of concept artists and visual development artists. We had a team of scene illustration artists. And then even when it went into production, the final line artists and background artists and like cleanup teams, they all brought so much to the, to the visuals. So, you know, you have to give all of them credit. Yeah, it's a massive crew of really talented people and uh, they make us look good. We can sit in front now and say, oh yeah, well, yeah, we did it all. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other, the other thing besides Wolf Vision that I wanted to ask you about specifically was sort of leaving in the trace lines and the kind of shapes inside the characters. Uh, it's a really striking sort of visual thing and I was wondering where that came from and like who sort of said, yeah, let's leave them in. And cause it's really, it really is sort of amazing. Well, it's stuff we talked about and played with in short films and stuff in the past. Mm. And I remember way back in Secret of Kells, the idea was that Ashling would have that, she was like a little forest spirit in Secret of Kells and she was going to have that rough and then we, we couldn't pull it off. It was a lot of extra work that when <clears throat> the other departments had to follow along one after the other. Because when you do that kind of work, there's no real assistant work. Everyone has to be an artist. So the animator might rough out the movement, but then the in-betweener or cleanup artist is really a final line animator. So it's much more like the Disney animation from like the 60s and 70s, like 101 Dalmatians. Yeah. And when you really see drawings on screen, there isn't kind of a process where there's a main animator, then an in-betweener, then a cleanup artist. Like that way was just those nine old men and their assistants putting their drawings directly on screen. And so we had to kind of almost go backwards to a, a process that had died out to get that effect. And we had a, a really talented department because they had to be a little bit like, you know, comic book inkers or something. They had to really recognize what they're doing, wasn't tracing. They were, and it's traditionally called the cleanup department, but they were really final line artists. You know, they were doing much more than just cleaning up the animator's drawings. So yeah, that was a big thing. And, and the reason that we did it was it has a liveliness. You know, I think it, it made the wolves seem wilder and it allowed us that when Mae was angry to make the lines scratchier and more angry, or when she was happy to make the lines more soft and curvy. So while the main characters in the town have that harsh woodblock print look, which is fairly uniform, the, the wild characters, the wolf walkers and the wolves could look uh, you know, kind of have different line styles depending on how they felt or how they were behaving, you know? Yeah, because Maeve, Maeve had to be like this little ball of energy that is like unpredictable and everything. So the fact that there are these little lines popping all around, you know, adds to that, that great personality. Yeah. Were there sort of visual touchstones that you were looking at? You mentioned Richard Williams earlier and you can definitely see that obviously, but were there any other things that you guys were inspired by uh, making Wolf Walkers? Oh, so much. Princess Kaguya was one of one of the main ones, especially for Wolf Vision. 
Yeah. Um, like just the fact that when, uh, you know, like that there are just uh, charcoal strokes representing trees and, and it seems so alive and so like hand drawn, you know, that was definitely one that we refer it's to so again and again. so brave that someone with such a long career and everything and Ghibli are so well known for a certain style. It was so inspiring to see Takahata just went and said, no, I'm going to do something completely Mm. you know like that and expressive and everything so that was a big influence for the backgrounds 101 dalmatians was a huge influence as well just uh, especially in their early conceptual work um, they they like they have amazing beautiful uh, backgrounds with just very big flat shapes uh, and then even in the cleanup style of 101 dalmatians the fact that they used to photocopy them or yeah there was like xerox yeah xerox the, line, so it. the pencil lines made it onto screen kind of yeah. rather than having to be traced so yeah, and then I suppose we looked at stuff like Art Nouveau and, and um, you know, Gustav Klimt. Uh, very early on, we had even more flowers and patterns in Maeve and <laughs> Maeve's hair. It got a little bit refined just for the sake of the wrists of the animators, but it still has a little touch of that. Kind yeah, of that. and then um, Cyril Pedrosa and Emily Hughes were a huge influence on the, the look of the forest too. And we were lucky enough to get some concept work from, from them as well. Yeah, Cyril is a great comic book artist, French comic book artist. He used to work for Disney in Paris, but now he's, he's one of his best books, I'd say, is The Three Shadows. And um, he's actually Portuguese, but he works in France. And uh, it was great. He did some concepts for us very early on, but his books are exactly what we're talking about in terms of graphic novel inspiration. If a, if a character in a panel is sad, it might just be a black blob of sadness, you know, for that panel and then become a character again in the next panel. He uses the full gamut of expressiveness, almost like German expressionist cinema from the 20s or something right. in his comics. So that's the kind of bravery we were going for, you know, since it was our last hurrah. <laughs> Well, I wanted to know, you know, this is obviously this is the first animated feature uh, co-produced by by Apple. And I was wondering what their sort of involvement was and how much, you know, did they give notes? I mean, what was that process like for you guys? Not too much. They were fairly hands off. Okay. Um, we actually knew Tara Sorensen from when she worked in Amazon and we'd done some TV series with her in her former role. So when she moved to Apple, we already knew her. And when we pitched um, Wolfwalker, she was just starting the kids department in Apple TV Plus. And it was, I think it was one of her first acquisitions. So it was fantastic because we were in right at the beginning. And it, it was pretty hands off. There was some notes, some things we had to concede. Obviously, it was for a family audience. They were thinking about the fact that it was an international audience. But nothing, they were, they're, they fairly much trusted us to make the film we said we were going to make. So that was great. Yeah, there was, there was one or two little um, Irish semi curse words that we had to. Yeah, we weren't we allowed to, to say feck in this one, yeah. even though they say it in Song of the Sea, but <laughs> things like that. So if they're the only notes that come, minor, then we were like, yeah, that's, minor, that's fine. Very yeah. minor stuff. Yeah. There wasn't right. any like, yeah, Act 3 needs to be rewritten or anything. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. That character needs to be blue now. Yeah. You know, not, they were really great. They really got behind the vision that we had from the beginning. And it's nice to be able to say that because the fear is always, oh, you're going to you know, have a bigger budget, but you're going to work with a big company and then maybe it won't be yours anymore and stuff. But no, it wasn't like that at all. It felt very like empowering. Okay. And they trusted us, so. Great. Well, I mean, do you guys, are you guys working on something else right now? I mean, I know it's very hard to, at the end of this long journey, to even think about the next thing, but or have you guys started yeah. working on things? Uh, I'm in the middle of a short film that I'm really passionate about for Greenpeace that okay. hopefully will get released in theaters with Wolfwalkers um, at the end of the month or maybe in November. And that's, that's got such similar themes. When Greenpeace approached us about it, I couldn't say no, even though I was pretty exhausted because it's about the destruction of the Amazon at the moment. And it features like a magical jaguar who comes into an urban setting to tell the kids that the jungle isn't that far away. It's in your kitchen, actually, in the stuff that you buy um, and stuff they eat. So that's an interesting short. But then after that, I think both Ross and I are going to take a, a break. Yeah, I'm going back to painting anyway. I'm going to step away from animation for half a year or a year, or, you know, just to, just to paint pictures. <laughs> yeah, but um, here in Cartoon Saloon, we have two features in production at the moment. We have Puff and Rock, the movie, which is for preschoolers. It's a, a preschool show that's in, in production now. And even the voice of Maeve is the voice of, an, of a new Puffin in that. And then My Father's Dragon for Netflix. Nora is directing a huge feature for Netflix that um, I'm really excited about just as a fan because I don't have to work on it. I can just admire it from a distance. 
<laughs> well, I mean, what what is the, if you guys can talk briefly about the kind of like, like what has the streaming landscape kind of done to animation? Has it kind of opened it up for, for different styles and, and 2D and things like that? Or how do you guys see that? It's been amazing. Yeah, I think it's great. Like when we started with uh, Secret of Kells, there was a, like a European co-production model where tiny studios would scrape together enough money, not never enough money, but a bit of money to try and make a movie. And it was always on a wing and a prayer. And then you had to hope that you'd get distribution afterwards. And then um, we went through the era of uh, G Kids and all of that. And now it's amazing to see the amount of hand drawn animation, stop motion, and all different types of stories being told because of the streaming services. So hopefully the streaming services are opening niche audiences all over the world that can enjoy these kind of movies. So we don't have to make every animated movie Pixar esque. We can make a movie for a smaller niche demographic that can find it on a streaming service. So that's my hope anyway. Right. Well, guys, thank you so much for chatting with me this morning, and I hope everything is okay in Ireland and everyone is yeah. staying safe and doing doing their work and all that. But the movie is amazing, so it, it meant a lot to get to talk to you guys, and hopefully we'll chat on the next one. And maybe we'll talk about one of your paintings in the next year. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> <laughs>